Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your
will harm you if you are eager to do what is good. But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. You do not fear what they fear, and you do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. And if you do it with gentleness and reverence, keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, the those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sin once for all. For righteousness righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, and in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, the persons, were saved through water. In the baptism, which this prefigured, now saved. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word. Thanks be to God.
gravitated towards this week. I was struck by the first reading in which Paul is in Athens and he's talking about this unknown God and relates that to Jesus and a little bit of, of the other readings as well. So having said that, I'll start off this way. When I was uh, at Christmas time on my, in 1975, when I was 13 years old, my brother, my older brother, he bought me an electronic handheld football game. And I thought, wow, this is really cool, this is neat. But within 20 minutes, I figured out how to win every time. How to defeat this. <laughs> so I kind of got a little boring real quick. Now we're talking about artificial intelligence and what it may or may not be able to do. And of course, when a lot of people think of uh, artificial intelligence or AI, they think of uh, the movie Terminator and, you know, which, uh, you know, AI gets a life of its own and then decides to destroy the human race. Or um, there's several other movies along that same genre, science fiction, where, you know, artificial intelligence, like I said, becomes self-aware and uh, dominates uh, humanity. In our Eucharistic prayer C that we use um, during the season of Epiphany, uh, there's words in there that says, from the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. This is not necessarily evolution or creation, but a balance between the ego and the divine. Or this, this, and the ego being the sense of self, or the I thou, that there's, there's me and there's something beyond me. Or as Rene uh, Descartes uh, said, I think, therefore, I am. How do we account for the divine in the knowledge of self, of ourselves? How do we go about differentiating between who we are and what is beyond us being a, a creator God? There's never been a time in uh, human history and evidence shows when humanity, when it become aware of itself, did not think of something beyond itself. That even archaeologists uh, who are still digging up stuff in human remains or finding where people, ancient people dwell, going back tens of thousands of years, that they find evidence that they worship something. They worship gods, or they worship something beyond themselves as, as a god, and understood that there was something beyond themselves, a creator. Then there's been periods of time in which human knowledge has evolved and, and grown. And not, I use the word evolved, but as we got smarter, I guess you could say. And we, so that's part of where then Paul gets into uh, you know, the Greeks really made a, a leap uh, in the proliferation of technology and philosophy and religion. And you had Aristotle and Plato, and which eventually came back in in a uh, revival, neoclassical revival at one point. Then also, even in our own Bible, uh, during the Apocalypse, period, you have the wisdom of Solomon, you have Ecclesiastes, you have this Jewish wisdom that, that uh, tells us, that differentiates between uh, the created, the human being, and wisdom, and the wisdom of God. And so, Apostle Paul, he, he's uh, doing his evangelistic rounds from city to city, and he goes into Athens, Greece, and he sees all of these different gods for, you know, different reasons. And then he sees this one that says, to the unknown God. And so then he has to, he uses that as a jumping off point to then explain to them that, yeah, there is this unknown God, this creator of all things. And while he doesn't use the name of Jesus Christ, he refers to Jesus Christ as that unknown God and that part of the the Trinity of, of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Spirit. Then another leap that uh, was, there was, we had these dark ages uh, where uh, Aristotle and Plato and everything was lost to humanity. But then there was this Renaissance period that took place between the 14th and the 17th century. And it was really, like I said, a Greek revival where they refound Aristotle and Plato, and, and it was expressed in art. It was a flourish of, of life uh, in, in human history. And then after that, then there was the Enlightenment period, where it was the, considered the age of reason, where everything that exists and everything that happens can be reasoned, that, that you can find a reason for it. Even things that, that maybe you didn't understand, if you understand it enough, you can, you can come up with a reason for it. But that didn't necessarily always include God. Then making another leap in history, we have then the 19, late 1960s. In the age of Aquarius, probably some of you are going to have that song in your head now. <laughs> The, it ended up, <laughs> ended up being a starting of a post-Christian era, in a sense. Or, and then there was started this exodus uh, from churches as people started grasping New Age religions and uh, looking, even the Beatles went off and Hinduism and, and Buddhism and all that kind of stuff. And, Whatever the Beatles did, all the young people wanted to do at that time. Anything but Christ. Anything but Christianity. Because then Christianity and the church were seen as an institution. And this was a time where everything was anti-institution. That you, you had to uh, rail against that. And there's this idea that then there was no God. Although there was a counter-revolution to that, and there's actually uh, a movie out now called, I think, The Jesus Revolution, that was that counter-culture to that, where there was young people that were actually gravitating towards Jesus Christ. So, when we, we live in a world of, of atheists and agnostics, and so how do we reason with them? How do we argue with them? And the answer to that is we don't have to. We don't have to do that. Because even throughout times of history, those even in the age of reason, there were people like Immanuel Kant in 1781, who he wrote critique of, of pure reason, who said that, that there is something beyond whatever reason we have. If we reason and we understand something, it's not because of our intelligence, it's because of the intelligence that God gave us in this life. Then one of the persons that, that I studied uh, a lot in uh, seminary, I've talked about it, Paul Tillich, he says that there's no such thing as an atheist because every human being in their thought will eventually have to come to this idea of ultimate, what he calls ultimate concern, which is something beyond themselves. And that this ultimate concern then is, becomes, is really, is God. That there's, you know, there's some meaning to life beyond themselves and their own ego. And I know I'm getting really deep here, but, <laughs> but this is kind of like Paul and, and and, and Athens, that, um, you know, trying to put a label on something uh, that's, that's unknown. And, but our, our job is, as Christians, is when the world about us and outside of these walls, when it comes to, to trying to understand the meaning of life, and everybody does it, I guess that's what ultimate concern is, is what is the meaning of life? But that should eventually come back to, to an understanding of, of the Creator, of, of God, and of uh, Jesus being that, that ultimate concern. So we can put a face to what they're trying to understand. And then when we do that, then we can tell.
help them. That's their unknown God. And then we can put that, that face and then that story to that. And that's that. The face is Jesus Christ. And the story is of God's salvation. Just as Paul did, we can do that same, same thing today. But we also have to be willing to say times when we're trying to explain life and reason, to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. Because there is that wisdom that passes all understanding. And when we get to that point in life and think that we understand everything, of course, when we get to the point where we don't understand something, that's where God begins. That's where Jesus Christ begins. So I'm not horrendously worried about artificial intelligence. And Lydia and I were having a conversation the other day about this. And, and this is where the gospel gets to. This idea of love. That what AI can't do is AI can't be human. It can't love. It can't understand the deepest fathoms of unconditional love. And that's where God is, because God is love, and all things come of God. And so I'm not worried about AI because it can't love. And as long as we follow Jesus' commandment to love one another, and as God loves us and as Jesus loves us, then we will survive whatever AI prays about.
Disciple Prayer in St. John's, Washington, Reverend Dennis Latta, in the Diocesan Cycle of Prayer. We also offer prayer for our companion diocese, the Diocese of Brasilia and their Bishop Mauricio, and our partnership with St. Andres Mouton in the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. To have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. We especially pray for those who are ill. Quincy Fitzgerald, Judy, Grant Laughlin, Andy, Bobby Harper, Beth Hill. We pray for those with special needs. Sodex, Nick, Doris Gurdon, Joe Brenner, Melanie Newman, Ron Stover, Julie, Stephen and Perry Grubbs, Austin, Don Ashworth, Susan and Bill Dunn, Leon and Della, Margaret Rutherford, Claire and Navy Bear. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon them. We remember today <clears throat> Susan Thomas. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. We give thanks to the Lord for all the blessings of this life. We give thanks for River and Fruit Food Pantry and its director, board, and volunteers. For the birthday of Ron Stover. Are there any other things to give us? Give thanks that despite all this partying that William Curtin graduated from college for Rachel, uh, for uh, Price, for her graduation and all her engagement. Thanks for the recent marriage of my niece. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord.
point for our United Bank offering uh, in Battery this spring. If you're going, oh darn, I forgot my coins, if you could try to bring them in uh, in the next couple of days, uh, that would be great. Uh, also, next Sunday is our uh, kind of unofficial end of the uh, program year or Sunday school year, even though classes may continue on uh, throughout the summer. Uh, although I had sent out an email that um, uh, until that is healthy enough that uh, the uh, Wednesday Bible, women's Bible study and uh, Sunday school is kind of on hold. Um, but next Sunday with this recognition Sunday, and there's a, we're having a pitch in. Marion Burris is providing uh, pulled pork and pulled chicken. So uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back of the church and in the parish hall for that. Or you can just uh, email Robin to say how many is coming and uh, the food that you might be bringing, not that you need to bring. Uh, our kitchens, there's usually plenty to eat. Uh, also, next Sunday evening is the baccalaureate service at the high school. And so if you want to honor we're blessed in our community to um, have a school that allows for Christian prayer. And so it's good that that continues. This coming Thursday is Ascension Day, and I will be live streaming, streaming a morning prayer service uh, to honor that day. Um, it's 40 days after Easter, and then after that, then we get into Pentecost. Are there any other announcements this morning? As you, you what went through the parish hall, you probably noticed that some work did get done, but the humidity was so tough this past week that the drywall mud uh, did not dry in time for them to get it all sanded down painted. So hopefully it will get all get done this week. Let us with gladness bring our offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true pastoral lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
words that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. For those of you watching at home, let us pray together the prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah.